him for clarification when he gets here. I, I, if you don't know anything about me, I don't get too super caught up in denominational stuff, okay? Um, yes, we are a church of God, and yes, I'll tell you what we believe, but uh, I'm not one of those. If you come to town and I'll, I feel led to ask you to speak, if you're Baptist, I'm going to ask you to preach. If you're Baptist, if you're, I, I, don't, I don't care about that. Um, so he's going to be coming. He's bringing a group of seven men with him. They're going to be volunteering with Samaritan's Purse. He does this, tries to do it every year. Um, but I was connected with him through uh, Richard Bird, who attends this church, and we've been talking for about three or four months now um, on the phone, getting to know each other. I've not met him in person yet. Um, he's been pastoring that church for a lot of years. He's been in ministry for over 30 years. But in the area of Kentucky that he lives in, um, there are several prison systems there. And uh, for 30 years, he has been the chaplain in multiple prisons uh, down there. And that's really, you know, kind of very similar to this church. He has built, the foundation of his church has been built on people that he's ministered to in jail and that got out and ended up coming to his church. So I'm asking you to be here next Sunday. Amen? They are going to stay at our camp. They have made a, gener a generous donation to our camp to stay out there, even though that wasn't necessary. We were going to let them stay. They're coming two days early to fish, and then after two days, they're going to Samaritan's Purse, and they're going to do work out there. Some of the guys that he's bringing with him had to get special uh, written, uh, what's it called? The letter, letter of, uh, I forget what it's called. Like, they can't even leave the state without, without the, yes. Yes, there it is. See, we've got some professionals in here that know what they're talking about. Um, but he's bringing these group, these group of men with him. He, one of the first questions he asked me was, do I have to wear a suit because I'm packing light? And I, I just kind of chuckled and said, no, we don't wear suits in my church. I have watched him online. I have talked to him. I've spent time with him. Let me give you a, a caution. He pulls no punches. The people that he ministers to, they need to get it straight in more ways than one. And so that's how he delivers it. Uh, he preaches hard, but he preaches truth. And that's the kind of preaching I like. Amen? So I want you to come. Um, there's flyers that are out there on the table. Grab these. Um, if you are, are partners with or friends with or in one of our Freedom Houses or other houses that we have here in town, put these out there. I'd love for people to come and hear him, hear him speak. Um, he's going to do both services, 9 and 11, um, Pastor Scott Mann. That's next Sunday. So looking forward to him, him being here and greeting him with a crowd. Amen? All right. Man, I'll have no time. I'll have to do some condensing. Can you be patient with me this morning? Um, I'll try to be as fast as I can. Last week we talked about, anybody remember what we talked about last week? Really? Offense. Offense. And not the thing that divides one yard from another. The other offense, okay? So we talked about offense. And I had two other people walk up to me after church. If you're one of them, I'm not making fun of you, but it was, it was funny for me. They walked up to me and was like, man, I want to know the rest of the story. What happened to those two guys? I was like, it's in the Bible. Go read the rest of the story. Um, I had already planned on preaching this next sermon, um, but I didn't really think about how it aligned in order um, with, with what I, I spoke on last week. But the title of the sermon today is called The Comeback. How many of you enjoy a good comeback story? Amen. Uh, you ever see Rudy? Love to see a good comeback. Amen. So I want to talk about a comeback today. I'm not going to go back to the story that we read um, the other day. By the way, if you, if you want to know the rest of the story, it's pretty simple. Those two guys went to, uh, to the sweet place to get their beer grown back, to get their dignity back. David basically went and killed everybody. The end. Okay, that's the, <laughs> that's the, the king took care of business while the two people that were offended healed. Amen? That's what your God does for you. Not that he goes and kills everybody, but... He doesn't need you to take vengeance. He can take care of that. Remember we talked about vengeance in our hand is ruthless, it's murderous, it's awful. Vengeance in his hand is just, it's truth. Amen? So we're going to move on from the offensive part of, of what we talked about last week, and we're going to talk about the comeback. Uh, there's one character in the Bible, and, and if, you, if you read the Word and you, you've read you know, the Old Testament, if you've gotten to know me, this will come as no surprise to you, but there's one character in the Bible that is just basically my favorite character. I, I love reading about him. Um, I, I've, I've done so many sermon series on him and taught on him. There's so much to talk about. We talked about him when we did our prayer series on prayer, but I love Elijah, okay? Elijah was hardcore. 
and, and I, I strive to be more like him, but um, if you read about Elijah, like so many prophets in the Bible, he wasn't perfect. Amen? Is anybody in here perfect today? Just before we get started, you might be online at home watching TV. You're perfect. I apologize, but we're not perfect here, okay? What I love about Elijah, he's, he's a lot like David and other prophets. He struggled and he failed and he doubted and he messed up. God restored him and he moved on. Amen? So I want to talk about Elijah. Probably out of all the stories of Elijah in the Bible, the, the one that, that for me is, takes the cake, it's my favorite, is the story in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. It's, it's the prior chapter to what we're going to be studying today where he is... Um, he stands up to uh, Jezebel and King Ahab and 450 prophets of Baal and Elijah and God handle business that day. That's, that's my favorite story of the Bible. I, I can't imagine being in the position that he was in. He's got a king, a king's wife, Jezebel, and all these prophets. And what I, I'm not going to get too deep in the story. I'm not even going to talk about that. But, but my favorite recollection of that story is in the Bible, and I'm paraphrasing where it says Elijah stood off to the side while the prophets of Baal had their turn, and they cut themselves, and they danced around, and they screamed, and they hollered, and they tried to wake up the, 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 the demon Baal. They, you know, come and prove who you are, and did Baal ever answer? No, he never did answer. And I love the part where Elijah, it's like he's off the side, and he kind of steps in and goes, maybe he don't hear you. Maybe he's busy. Maybe he's on vacation. It literally says that in the Bible. Maybe he went away for a while. Maybe you should scream harder. And, and you know, we know what Elijah's doing. He's taunting them. He, he, he's, he's saying to you, he's not listening because he's not real. Now go sit down. And then we know Elijah uh, built a bonfire. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. He built a bonfire, put a bull on it, dug a big ditch around the fire, had buckets and buckets of water thrown in the wood, on the sacrifice, so much so that it says it filled up the trench around the fire, and then he prayed a very simple prayer, called down fire from heaven, and it said that God came down in the fire, he consumed the offering, he consumed the wood, and it said that the, the tongues, the flames were like tongues licking up the water in the ditch. And then when he was done, he looked at the 450 prophets, and he said, it's your turn. The Bible says that he slew the 450 prophets, and, and some historians believe that he didn't just killed the 450 prophets, he killed them and their whole families because they represent they represented evil. I don't know that that's not the word of God, but that's, that's what some historians believe. So I want to pick up with the comeback. That doesn't sound like the beginning of a comeback story, but if you know the word, you know that there's more to the story. Any of y'all remember Paul Harvey? We're going to talk about the rest of the story today, amen? Some of y'all know what that is, some of you don't. So I'm going to start out in 1 Kings 19, 1 through 4. I'm going to reading out of the New, the New King James Version. It says, And Ahab, King Ahab, told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. He went home and told his wife, You're not going to believe what happened today. I'm not sure what he was thinking. If I was a king and I saw that happen with my own eyes and I knew that my wife would take issue with that, she'd be the last person I'd go home and tell what I saw. But it says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Wifey is not happy. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Let me translate that for you. So help me. I'm going to hunt you down, I'm going to find you, and I'm going to do to you in ten times worse what you did to our prophets. That's what she said. On the heels of a great day, let's be real, Elijah had a great day. Amen? He had a great day. I don't know if it was the next day or the next week, but it was a relatively close amount of time between the great day and this letter, this message coming from Jezebel. Watch what this great prophet of God says. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. What a knucklehead. It says, He arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. 
But he himself went another day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. What I wouldn't give to have been a fly on the wall. Number one, I don't think there are already flies in heaven. But to have been a fly on the wall of the throne room and seen the look on God's face when that prayer came rolling in. Can you imagine how God must have felt? After doing what he did, at the beckoning of Elijah's prayer, no offense here, ladies. I don't think we have any Jezebels in here. One woman sends a message, and he's scared for his life. He has just experienced the favor of God on his life in one occurrence that is immeasurable, what God did for him that day. One message from a controlling king's wife puts him on his heels. He defeated a demon, Baal. It wasn't even a real, a real God. 450 prophets, and one woman rocks his world. Let me die, Lord. I'm scared, and I don't know what to do. 1 Kings 19, 5 through 8 is where I want to focus the rest of our, our time. As humans, all too often, what we do is we, we look at what Elijah did. He was scared, he was worried on the hills of a great victory, and most of the time when you hear this preached, it focuses on what he did wrong, right? That's human nature. We're not going to do that today. We're going to focus on what he did right. If you know me and you've listened to me preach, you know that I like to look. We do this in Bible studies sometimes. I like to look at the Word and not just look at it for what it says. Look for patterns in the Word, rhythms in the Word, things that I can look at and go, man, he did this, he did this, he did this, and he got that. That's a pattern. That's something I need to do. I need to pattern myself after that. Are you with me? Y'all got to do better in the first service now. I got to know you're with me. 1 Kings 19, 5 through 8. We're going to use these, these few verses here to model a pattern for what we should do as a comeback. It says, Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Many people believe that when you read in the Old Testament of an angel of God or the angel of God coming, if they don't name it specifically as a certain angel, a lot of people believe it's Jesus. It's, it's God incarnate coming to, to, to minister. But he says, Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Verse 6 says, Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals. It was angel food cake. And a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. Verse 8, So he arose, and he ate, and he drank, and he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights as far as Oreb, the mountain of God. The first thing that I want to do here is, is highlight what I just said. I don't want to spend any time looking back at what happened after the last prophet was killed and what happened to the point that he encountered this angel. Those are the things that he did wrong. Do we need to understand what we did wrong? Do we need to understand what other people have done wrong? But we can't stay there, church. Now, I want you to hear what I'm saying here. I know as I, as I make this point, the elephant in the room, you're, you, some of you are going to think about uh, a program that, that our church, uh, I'll, just, I'll just say it because he's probably going to see this, and I know Brittany's here. I'm going I'm to make this point, and some of you are going to go, well, no, wait a minute, that's against what is taught in the hidden heart. You're, you're talking against. No, that's not what I'm doing. Gene, I love you. This is not against anything you teach. Because if you listen and you pay attention to Gene in his class, he'll, he'll drive the point home for you that as you go back and examine, you can't stay there. You've got you to look at it, 
You got to process it, and you got to move on. Well, Pastor, I can't get on board with that. I, I, I just, I, I believe that if we forget, well, tell you what, don't take my word for it. Okay, let's see what the Word of God says. Philippians chapter three, beginning in verse twelve. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. That I may hold, lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, remember what Kevin Gall said about the therefore. Therefore is the reason that it's therefore. Amen? Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. He's saying, look ahead. Don't look back. Let's keep going. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 25. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn right or left. Remove your, fruit, your foot from evil. What is he saying? Stop looking back. Keep moving forward. I'm not done yet. Isaiah 43, beginning in verse 18. Do not remember the former things. Look at your neighbor. If you agree with the Word of God and say, do not remember the former things, nor consider or contemplate or ponder or teeter on the things of old. Behold, I love this part, Behold, I will do a new thing. Is anybody in here glad when you look back at your life that God's promise is that he's getting ready to do a new thing? It says, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? It will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Do you need any more? There's three scriptures beginning in the New Testament and working their way back in the Old Testament that tells you you've got to let that go and you've got to look for that. You've got to press forward. Amen? Now, I have so little time. I'm going to have to fly through this. The things that Elijah did right. Number one, he was obedient. You have to be obedient. Obedience is, is important. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen? That's the Word. That's what the Word says. The first thing he did is he was obedient. Verse 6 says, if you can pull that up, Reese, we'll go through like we did last, last service, just work through the First Kings 19, beginning in verse uh, 5. Yeah, First Kings 19, beginning in verse 5. It says, so he ate. Church, I want you to hear me. The Word of God, whether you look at it on your phone or in a book, is not a book of suggestions. It's not what it is. I know we don't want to call it law because law sounds like, it's, it's, it's not a book of suggestions. It is a book that's put together and assembled to give you a road map for life. It's not suggesting that you shouldn't commit adultery. It's saying, do not commit adultery. It's not, a, it's not a book to condemn you if you did. There's plenty in there about restoration and forgiveness. It's not a book of suggestions. Amen? 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not made of flesh, bones, tools, steel, instruments, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Watch this, strongholds. When we think of strongholds, we think of prison bars and castle walls. Nope, that's not what strongholds are. Casting down strongholds, or pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments. This isn't talking about 
husband and wife arguments. This is talking about, Tim, who do you really think you are trying to lead this club of guys? I mean, really, dude, look in the mirror. Do you remember who you are? That's an argument. That is the enemy taking his past and saying, you can't do that. You need to wake up and realize that you've already disqualified yourself. You have to, and he knows this, that's why I picked him, you, you have to cast that argument down. You have to look in the mirror and say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world running his mouth in this argument that's thrown in front of me. You have to do that. Amen? John 14, 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Number two, the second thing that Elijah did after he was obedient and he ate, it says in verse 8, he got up. He'll get it up there here in just a second. He arose. You have to arise, church. We cannot get it done, get it being advanced the kingdom of heaven with these under our, under our rear end sitting on them. The very thing that sets you apart as a believer is the fact that the God that you serve did one thing that no other God has ever done. Anybody know what that is? He arose. He ain't in that grave, church. He got up out of it. That's what empowers you to be who you are called to be. The fact that he arose. He got up. We have to arise. We can't sit here and hope that he'll do a work all these miracles. No. You want to know what the miracle is? You're the miracle. You're the miracle. You're the miracle. Get off your hands and go out there and be used. We're talking about comebacks this morning. Literally, the greatest comeback of all time was Resurrection Sunday. I mean, I, there's so many songs I can think of. Uh, Carmen, I'm telling my age now. Carmen, some of you don't even know who that is. Before contemporary Christian music, there was Carmen. And there was a couple songs that he did. One of them was, the, I think, called The Champion, where he was a boxer. But that's a picture. That's an illustration of all of hell. I mean, y'all got to understand, in the spiritual world, the devil thought he won. He said, he doesn't, he's not all-knowing. All he knows is there's a physical body drained of blood, dead in a grave, I win, you lose. Hell was, was celebrating that day and all night. Imagine when they woke up Easter Sunday morning with a hangover from partying all night and looked at that grave and Jesus wasn't there no more. We don't get excited about that enough, church. Jesus was beaten, he was spit on. The Bible says chunks of his beard were ripped out of his face. Three-inch thorns were shoved into his skull. He was stabbed, he bled out on the cross. He came back. Acts 26, 14 through 18, And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Anybody know who Saul is? Paul. Who is this asking him in the Hebrew language? Imagine being Paul, the guy who thinks he's doing it right, going out and dragging wives, husbands, and children, the Christians, out of their homes and killing them in the street. And all of a sudden, Jesus is standing in front of you going, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise, stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you... Man, this, this is what gives me hope for who I am. He says, paraphrasing, I don't care how many Christians you've killed. I don't care how many babies you've killed. I don't care how many wives you've killed. I don't care what you've done. You are on the wrong path. Hear me, accept me, and let me put you on the right path. Put all this nonsense you've done behind you. This is the chore I have ahead of you. Somebody here needs to hear that this morning. But arise, stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you 
for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. Translation. Translation. Y'all, for some reason, I'm leaning to my left here, so I'm going to pick on you now, Brittany. That's what, this is what that means. The things you've encountered in your life, he says, I'm going to use that, but there's a whole lot more I'm going to show you and reveal to you on the way. Use your testimony. It's powerful. But don't let your testimony define who you are. That's his job. He says, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Jesus has chosen a mass murderer to go and tell people you can, get, you can be forgiven. Ha! Figure that one out. And you think you're disqualified because of some trivial stuff you've done or not done? Man, number three, he consumed. Verse 8 says that he not only got up, it says that he ate and he drank. This is symbolic to us as we read it because what was given to him was bread. And from a biblical standpoint, when I tell you to consume bread, what am I really telling you to consume? The Word of God. We have got to acquire and build a pattern in our life for acquiring a taste, a hunger for consuming the Word of God. We live in a world and a society where you look at, I love you, Facebook, not really, I just use you, let's be real. We look at Facebook and Instagram and we look at these things and everything we see tells us what we are supposed to think. You want an opinion? I'll give you an opinion. If you want an opinion, get hungry for the Word of God. You will get up every day and walk out of your house unapologetic for the, for the salvation message that has already saved you. And you won't be apologetic for it. And I'm going to give you a little news flash and a prediction. The world is going to hate you for it. But when you have the truth dwelling up in you, your feet are going to be planted like concrete blocks in the ground. You're going to be immovable. When people doubt what you say or they try to take the Word of God and put some human twist on it or say, well, that may be what it says, but this, that, and the other, just smile and nod. Whatever you say. But I know what it says to me. And I know what the truth is. And I pray every day, me, I pray every day, God, give me a hunger that only the Word of God can, can, can resolve. Matthew 4, 4 says, But Jesus told him, No. The Scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone. They live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Every word in that Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, is the Word of God. I don't know if there are other books out there. I, I've got some of them in my office that they say was originally part. I, all I know is I have a Bible in front of me, and that's what I use. I don't have all the answers. I will one day. I don't have all the answers, and I'm okay with that because the Bible actually says there are some mysteries that you're not meant to know. That's where faith comes in. You either have it or you don't. This is okay? All right. Number four. Tell you, look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, your get up and go needs to get up and win. The next thing that Elijah did is he went. Verse 8 says, I think it actually says it. You got me, Reese? So he arose, and he ate and drank, and he, he went. We come to a point here that I'm probably going to lose some people, but I pray you hang on. Elijah did not sit still in that place of depression and mediocrity. He didn't have the answers. All he knew is that this angel appeared and said, here's some bread, here's some water, drink it, you're going to need the energy. 
I would imagine if an angel appeared to me and offered me bread and water, I'd probably be filled with faith too because I'd be like, oh my gosh, it's an angel. Can I touch you? But he got up and he went. Exodus 14, 15, I absolutely adore this verse of Scripture. I love the relationship that Moses had with God. This is Moses and God having a conversation. It says in 14, uh, verse 15, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? I just, I just, can I be real with you? I just feel like sometimes when God hears me, he goes, why, why are you crying? Why are you crying? Why are you whining? He says, why do you cry to me? Here you go. This is what I'm telling you today. Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Don't worry about what they did or didn't do. Don't worry about what happened and what didn't happen. Don't worry about what they don't understand. Get up and went. Go. I'll give you the answers you need when you need them. That is the cusp of the biggest issue with our young people today. There is so much information out there, they feel like they have to have all the answers spiritually before they can act. And that is the destroyer of faith. Faith is not having all the answers and acting. Faith is acting and then getting all the answers. Or being given the peace to live without the answer. After Elijah obeyed and arose and consumed the word and went, then he entered in. I'm drawing to an end here. Give me just a few minutes. He says he entered in. First Kings, I didn't give you this one, Reese, so if you throw it up there, fine. If you don't, fine. First Kings 19, verse 9 through 13, it says, And there he went into a cave. He spent the night in that place, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here? Can anybody identify with that? I mean, I have had God just, What are you even doing, man? Why are you here? What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God. This is what makes me like identify with Elijah. Wait a minute, God. I have been very zealous for you. I have preached your message. I have defeated four people. I have said to you, Lord, I alone have done this for you. Ah. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. That's what I do. Lord, it's in church people's fault. They ain't listening to you, Lord. They're doing what they want to do. They won't listen to me either. Then he said, go out. Stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains, and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, still. So it was, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle, he covered it up, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave, suddenly... A voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? We as a church, as a believer, have got to get to a place where we, we desire not just to be obedient, to be in his word, but to go into that quiet place. To go into that quiet cave, closet, bedroom, whatever it is, turn everything off, but hear me carefully, close the Bible... Say the prayer you want to say and then hush and listen. Some of us have got the Word down. We've got our prayer life down. We even fast. We do all these things. And God is up there just kind of waiting. Okay, when are you going to be still and let me speak into you? When are you going to get still and let me tell you what I need to tell you? Yeah, you've got the Word and you've, got, you've prayed and you've confessed and you've worshipped. All that looks great, but now hush for five seconds and let me speak to you. You have to be okay with going to the quiet place. I'm hurrying. Number six, he prepared. After all this, all this, this failure, imagine how angry God must have been and frustrated that Elijah had this great victory and he had this huge moral failure with depression setting in and anxiety and fear. God had every reason to punish him. But it's important that you notice that Elijah followed some steps. He went to this quiet place, and out of the quiet place, after his failures, 
God speaks to him again. And he gives him direction. Church, we need direction. God's will and the spirit of Elijah that is exercising his will in these last days is always, always, always to prepare us to anoint the next generation. The whole premise of me speaking life into Sophie is so that Sophie can speak life into somebody else and somebody else can speak life into somebody else. That is equipping and anointing the next generation. If we ain't doing that here, then we need to shut the doors and turn the lights on because that's what we're called to do, anoint the next generation. Sometimes we shrink that down to just our kids and our teenagers who probably aren't even listening right now, but that's okay. But we shrink that down to just them. No, it's not just them. It's the next generation of believers. We are in the last days. I, I know you've heard it your whole life like I have, but we're in the last days. There is no doubt we're in the last days. We have a, we have a job to do. Amen? I want to read two more verses and I'm going to wrap up. I'm done. God's promise or made a promise in Malachi. That's the book right before Revelation. 1 Kings 19, 15 through 19, the rest of the story at the cave. He says, Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, here it is, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. Next generation. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. Next generation. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Mehola, I don't know these names, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Now, God could handle all this on his own. But he's saying, Elijah, your time is coming to an end. You have failed miserably but I'm still going to use you to anoint the next generation. Hear me, church. Some of you in here think that because of your past, you have completely disqualified yourself from carrying on the legacy of God, and you're wrong. The enemy is lying to you. You have another person to anoint. You have another person to speak life into. You know how Billy Graham got to be Billy Graham? Because... He heard a, preacher that heard a 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 preacher that went to a place and a Sunday school teacher spoke into a guy and that's how Billy Graham came to be. True story. What would have happened to that legacy if that one Sunday school teacher had not spoken life into that one kid? You have a job to do. And God, this is the best part, could care less about what has happened up to this point. He just wants you to accept it and do it. Closing here, Malachi 4, 1 through 6. The Lord of heaven's army says the day of judgment is coming, burning like a furnace. On that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw. They will be consumed, roots, branches, and all. But for you who fear my name, the Son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And you will go free, leaping with joy like calves let out to pasture. On the day when I act, you will tread upon the wicked as if they were dust under your feet, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Remember, watch this. this is, he's telling you the prophecy, but now he's saying, but remember to obey the law of Moses. Did I tell you this is right before Revelation? Anybody that tells you you shouldn't read the Old Testament, take them right here. He says, Remember to obey the law of Moses, my servant, all the decrees and regulations that I gave him on Mount Sinai for all Israel. Look, here it is, this is you. Look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. Everybody in here, raise your hand. Everybody. Prophets. Spirits of Elijah, alive and well in our current time. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. We know in the end times, if you go on and read Revelations, that the spirit of Jezebel is also going to be prevalent in the end times. 
My prayer is that you will accept this pattern in your life today and that you will realize that you're not just meant to aimlessly shuffle through this world and this life. You have a purpose. And if you're not doing your side of that equation to establish and figure out what that purpose is, you're failing yourself and you're failing those that you're supposed to be anointing for future use. Amen? Stand to your feet. I don't know how hard Pastor Scott's going to be preaching next Sunday, so I figured I would just hit you at both barrels today and be done with it. <laughs> Church, there's a pattern in, in the messages that you're hearing and that you're going to continue to hear over the next few weeks. Um, beginning in August, we're going to be going into a series on Jonah. I know you think, oh, Jonah, we've heard that story before. There's so much there that you probably don't know. But the premise, the whole thing around Jonah is that God spoke to him and said, go to this city that's attacking my people and tell them that there is a God in heaven that loves them and that can help them. And Jonah said, no, I won't go. I don't want our church to be the church that looks at God and says, they can't be helped. We're just going to keep on doing us. That's not who we're called to be. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, even though the word is hard and it's sharp and it cuts going in and cuts going out, Father, we love you. We thank you for this word. Maybe I'm the only one, Lord, but I thank you for this word. It has challenged me and it has told me to refocus and look at what it is you have me doing as pastor and what we should be doing as a church. Father, I pray that if there be anybody here today that falls into the category that they're not sure where they're at, they don't know uh, if they're doing what they should be doing, maybe they think they're saved, but they're not sure. Father, I pray that right now everybody under the sound of my voice, even online, will hear that and, and question, are they where they should be doing what they should be doing? And if they are, Father, I pray that without hesitation right now they would make their way to this altar. There's no reason, no excuse, Father, to put that off any further. I would say to them, Lord, that there are no final answers that they're going to receive. There's not some magical music that's going to play while they're in this altar today, Lord, but the beginning can start today. I speak life into this church today, Lord. Help us to be hungry for you. Help us to be obedient. Help us to hunger for your word, Lord. Help us to get up and arise and go out. Lord, help us to be, to be willing to do the uncomfortable things to advance your kingdom. Father, we love you. We thank you for this word. We praise you. We, we just pray in advance for Pastor Scott for next week, Lord, that you would begin to anoint him and minister to him to bring the word. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everyone said amen. God bless you, church. I owe you almost 14 minutes the next time I preach. I'll make it up.